Steve, who cares as you've heard, and um, I'm a storyteller. I tell stories for a living. As a filmmaker, a media practitioner, and a songwriter, I tell stories. But I believe that the most powerful stories ever told are the stories that we tell ourselves. From time, we've been a you know, storytelling race, which is why we have griots, town criers, poets, filmmakers, songwriters, and even more recently, bloggers. We all are storytellers, everyday people. And you do this sometimes without even knowing that what you're doing is telling stories. So when you come back from work and you say to your, your friend, your partner, who will be away, that you won't believe what happened today. And then you launch into something that X did to you or Y didn't do to you. Or the story of something you saw that happened to somebody. We tell stories. Now the stories we have told at the time have always been to achieve a number of things. Which is to entertain, to educate, to caution, to share experiences, to document history and happenings, and sometimes to shape others' impression and opinions of us. You know, like when a boy meets a girl and he's trying to set the stage for what he expects of her and he's telling things that portray him in a certain light. Just he's trying to manage impressions. But most of all, what we do is trying to connect when we tell stories so we can better understand this thing called life. That's what we do when we tell stories. And from time, that's the more the reason why stories are told. And at its best, powerful stories can get you to be angry, inspired, make you laugh, make you cry, challenge your thinking. But at its worst, a story can paralyze you. It will lead you to inertia, set you in a mind space that doesn't move you forward. Stories can do either of this. And the examples of powerful stories that have been told abound in the lives of so many people and the things that we do every day. But I'll give you an example of, to me, what I consider one of the most powerful effects of a story on an individual. And that's the story that I read off of Eon.com of Megan Stewart. Now, Megan Stewart in her ninth grade, grade was given a lecture assignment, an assignment by her history teacher to come up with a project for the history, National History Day. And in research what this project would be, Megan stumbled on a, a old newspaper article. And the story in this old newspaper article was the story of Irene Sandler, a young Polish nurse, nurse in a war, war torn um, Nazi war uh, Poland at the time, who saved the lives of over 2,500 Jewish children. Now, how did she do this? She did this by giving the children new identities. So she would take a child, a Jewish child, give the child a new identity, and to get them across the border to safety, she would put them in sacks and put them under potatoes and drive past the Nazi guards to get them to safety. And she did that over and over and over again until she had moved 2,500 Jewish children between 1942 and 1943. Now, but not only was she doing that, every child whose identity she changed, she would write down the name and true identity of the child and put it in the jar. And then the hope was that when all of the problem was over, she would cross over, find these children, and give them back their identity. But this is something she did at great risk, because if she was caught, you can imagine what would happen to her. Going past the Nazi guards, moving 2,500 children. This story touched Megan so much that she and her three of her classmates decided that was going to be their project. So they wrote a play called A Light in a Jar. Megan, uh, of Irene. And they took it and performed it from school to school theater all over the country. And it became really popular. It was such a big hit that they even got to appear in the Today Show. That was quite big. But what is really big is not that. What is big is what then happened to Megan as a result of that. Because today, Megan, now known as Megan Felt, works in the Center for Unsung Heroes, which is a non governmental organization that shares with young children the stories of heroes they would never have heard about, you know, just like Irene Sandler. Now, that's how powerful the story can be. That something she read as far as ninth grade 
staying with her until that become her life's work. That's the power a story can have over you. And for me, stories are broken into two. The stories we tell others and the stories we tell ourselves. Now, the stories we tell ourselves are the most powerful stories. Why do I say so? I say this because when you hear a story or encounter an occurrence, what moves you to act or not act is your distillation of that story to a story that you tell yourself that says to you, it is okay to act or okay not to act. It's okay to do something or not do something. And that's a powerful story because all of our actions are based from the stories that we tell ourselves. If you do not convince yourself that it's okay to do something, if you do not sell that to yourself, no matter what you heard, you won't do it. So all of our actions draw from that. And ultimately, we all are a conglomeration of the stories that we've heard. The stories we've been told, we've watched, but mostly the stories that we've told ourselves. So I wonder sometimes that what is it that a Boko Haram person says to themselves that says, you know, it is okay today to go out and detonate a bomb, kill myself, and kill maybe 2,300, whatever number of people today. What is it that you say to yourself that makes it okay to go and do that? Stuff. What is it that a corrupt government official say to themselves that it is okay to take this money that is meant to build a hospital, a school, roads, bridges that would benefit hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people? What is it they say to themselves that says it is okay to take that money and appropriate it for themselves? You always have to tell yourself a story that makes it okay. What is it that we say to ourselves that makes it okay to love or to hate? What is it that we say to ourselves that says, deal with this or destroy that? It is all in the narrative and in the story that you tell yourself. And sometimes we're imbued with so much uh, preconceived notions of what we are. And when I meet someone for the first time, when we are interacting, what we're doing is we're trading stories with what you do or not do, what you say or not say, we're trading stories. And I take that story of you that I've gathered from my encounter and decide whether you're an okay person for me to become friends with or you're not an okay person for me to become friends with. But sometimes it's all in, in form, also to some degree starting off with stereotypes. In Nigeria, we have the Igbos, the Hausas, and the Yorubas, and we all have different kinds of stereotypes about ourselves. And sometimes that's the takeoff point. But as you interact, the story that you gather may become different from the story that you know. And then what you tell yourself that says it's okay to do this or not do that. Amazing stuff, the power of stories. Because it is in those stories that our actions are shaped. But what happens when you do not even tell your own story often enough? What happens is that other people tell your story for you. And that is even more dangerous. Because when someone tells your story, they tell it from their perspective and for their own purpose, never yours. And if you allow it, they can say it and say it so often that it defines your reality. And when it defines your reality, what then happens is that you begin to see yourself, your existence and your reality through the prism of how they see you. And that perhaps is the biggest problem that Africa has had. As a continent, our narrative has been shaped by other people for other purposes. And we've been painted down as this country of, of war, of hunger, starvation, extreme poverty, corruption, always the negative. And inspiring stories about Africa are tokenist. Every once in a while, you encounter a story that is inspiring about Africa. But largely, the tales that we get, the preponderance of negative stories about Africa impacts the way we think. And so therefore, the stories that you allow into your life work into shaping how you think and the stories that you tell yourself. So largely, we get to the point where we say to ourselves, life is almost mission impossible. Not in Africa. We can't do this. We can't do that. That's the narrative we've told ourselves to the extent where when we now tell our own stories, 
we also tell it from the negative point. So put a number of Nigerians together and they're having a conversation. And what you're likely to hear most often is what is not right, what is negative, what is not working. But every day in different corners of the country, ordinary people do extraordinary things. People are doing things to change Nigeria. Yet we do not see that. We do not lift up our own heroes. We do not celebrate them. We do not celebrate courage, bravery. You know, just sheer humanity, we fail to celebrate that. And that shows in so many ways. And, and I'll give you an example of Nigeria and the Ekmo expedition, you know, in Liberia, Sierra Leone. As a Nigerian, I know that my government spent a lot of money, millions of dollars, prosecuting that war. And in the process, many lives were lost. Many soldiers were paid. And yet, we stories of, stories of bravery, stories of sacrifice out of that encounter. Yet, out of the Vietnam War, out of um, the war in the Koreas, out of different war theaters across the world, Americans choose to tell inspiring stories, saving private life, the different kinds of stories that they tell that celebrates their heroes. And to, to buttress that point, I give you the still it down to another story that happened in Sierra Leone, the Mamioko Hotel incident. Now, that story is a story of 15 Nigerian soldiers during the Johnny Koromakuri in 1997 that were sent to go and protect the Mamioko Hotel, which would be the equivalent of the Eco Hotel today in Sierra Leone. When this coup happened, the expatriate community and a lot of people around there scared and looking for safety, and the soldiers were sent there to protect them. Johnny Karama had invited the rebels to come and join him in forming a government. Coming from the bushes, they were raping, they were, raping, they were stealing, and they were headed to the Mamiyuko Hotel to take it over because that's where everything was. And these 50 Nigerian soldiers had to fight them off. And they, that standoff lasted over five days, during which lives were lost, but ultimately peace was broken, and the US, France, Germany, the rest of the world could come and take their citizens to safety. Now that's extreme bravery on the part of the soldiers. Yet, no story. When we hear stories of Ekomo, what we hear is soldiers pillaging, soldiers stealing diamonds, soldiers raping. That's what the stories we tell. And but of this Mamioko incident, only one story has been told that I know of. And that is a book written by an um, English missionary called Chris Collin. And his book portrays him as a uh, almost Rambo-like character, who was the only person who fought off the rebels and secured the Mamiyoko Hotel. Now, as far as stories go, that's the narrative of what happened in Sierra Leone. That's the narrative that defines the whole Ekomo experience. And that's the narrative the world knows. By extension, that's what we know. But what is it that we are putting out? We are putting out negative stories instead of celebrating the heroism. The fact that over a period of time, peace was brought back to these war-torn countries by the sheer bravery and efforts of the soldiers. We lost in that. Today, Boko Haram is happening. We're not getting any of those stories either. Centralized. So the stories we tell have become so negative that we ourselves do not see anything good. And even the younger generation, because we have fed them a million of these stories so often, see that as their reality. And I'll paint that for you even more uh, by, by telling you um, about the documentary I watched recently. It's a documentary on Mad Joe, and it's called The Journey to Mars. And this documentary tells the story of how NASA, um, their various attempts at sending missions to Mars to probe it, get more information about it see if Mars has the possibility of containing life. And it documents every stage of the journey, their failures and their successes, until ultimately they succeeded in sending two missions to Mars and have continued to do so since then. And hopefully, soon maybe, Mars will be the next colony for man. That's what they've achieved and it's powerfully protected I and mean, portraying what they've done. But I look at that and I say, this same documentary will say two things to two different people. The American child, it says, it is possible. It can be done. The people who did it were raised as children to believe that anything is possible. Because the narrative of America we've been sold is a lack of possibilities where anything can happen. 
And so when they, ex they, they encountered difficulties, they were not seen as failures, they were seen as just challenges to overcome on the road to success. Success was never in doubt. That's the reality. And when an American child watches that documentary, that's what he gets. A Nigerian child or an African child watching that same documentary might realize the greatness of what has been achieved. So you know what he says in his mind to himself? It is possible only in America. Only in America. Because that is what we have told him in the stories that we have told him. That's what we call him. Only in America. These things happen to others, not me, not us. That's how powerful stories are.